All right, everybody, it's about that time to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for our February 2024 Adobe Marketo Engage Champion Office Hours. A big shout out and thank you to our organizers in the CHAMP program, Christiane, Darshall, and Courtney for the amazing work they do behind the scenes to make sure this event is a success. A few housekeeping rules we'd like to run through. Uh, at the top of the call here before we dive in. Uh, we want to make sure we say uh, these rules at the top of the call to let everyone know the rules of engagement, and they're pretty simple and straightforward. Um, no shameless self-promotion, please, if you would be so kind. Uh, we're not here to pitch you anything. This is exclusively knowledge share to further the community and not a sales event. So please don't uh, pitch your wares or offerings and services. Um, if you want to contact people outside of the user group after this call, you're going to need to obtain their consent. Uh, and if MUG members share their use cases here, uh, we ask that that information stays proprietary to the person that shared. So respect their um, anonymity and uh, don't share that information with anybody without their express written consent. Also, um, just to confirm, this meeting is being recorded. So if you do not consent to being in a live session that is recorded, uh, feel free to drop off now and we'll shoot you the recording at a later time when it's ready. Um, otherwise, uh, just know that your participation will be recorded today. Be sure to stay connected with our chapter. Um, pop on over to the Champ Office Hours mug and uh, enroll. It's a simple click uh, in your Adobe account uh, in Bevy, and you'll be notified every time we have upcoming office hours for the Champion Office Hours uh, user group. It's super handy. You can actually uh, join any mug uh, that you'd like to. So if you're interested in hearing about some of the virtual offerings and events uh, worldwide, feel free to opt in. It's a great way to connect with people globally and to learn from your peers. Speaking of opportunities to connect with your peers, we have a Champion Office Hours uh, coming up in March. Uh, we're going to be featuring some wonderful guests. Uh, some are new to the program, so some fresh perspectives, and some are uh, Champ Program veterans. So uh, be sure to uh, sign up for the the user group or watch social media for details and uh, be sure to join us should be a good time. And speaking of good times, I can't tell you how stoked I am to go to summit. I've lost count now at this point of how many Adobe summits and Marketo summits I've been to over the years, but I have to say last year, maybe it was just the vibe of everybody being back in person for the first time uh, post COVID, uh, the vibe was amazing. The sessions were on fire. Uh, the learning labs were awesome. And it was just a wonderful experience all around. So I know uh, this year is going to be bigger, better, and better than ever. Um, if you sign up now uh, before Valentine's Day next week, Wednesday, you'll still get a discounted rate. Uh, so visit summit.adobe.com for more information on the speaker lineup. Um, and if you have any questions about what the experience is like uh, from someone that's probably gone to more than she can remember at this point, uh, feel free to hit me up on social media. Happy to uh, share thoughts with you on LinkedIn. Also, if you've recently inherited a Marketo Engage instance, we have a wonderful email learning series that's been curated to help you be successful. Simply scan the QR code that you see on the page and uh, we've got a quick start program to help you uh, get off to the races and running. It's 10 emails delivered twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays for the cadence and uh, it's a wealth of information to show. So be sure to uh, opt in and, and see what you can glean from this series of emails. Also, um, we just had a wonderful session with Katja, uh, person scoring mastery with Marketo Engage, uh, localized nuances in the global framework. We uh, were so excited to see this program presented uh, by Adobe as a champ uh, community. We have loved the content it's produced. It's very thought provoking, very insightful. And I think we're gonna touch on some of the finer points of this content today 
um, I'd likely wager. So if you want that recording is available, uh, be sure to jump on it if you're interested in all things scoring. Upcoming mugs, you might want to note. Uh, the 22nd, Denver is going to be talking about preparing for your practitioner certification exam. Uh, that's been a hot topic for, cer for certain. Um, and the Atlanta mug uh, always has wonderful content. They're out in April. So opt in and see what they've got in store for you. Um, oh, some of these sessions are a little out of order here, but um, looks like there's a lot more on, on the docket than uh, just the two that I highlighted here. You can see February is chock full of great content. My buddy Lucas runs the Brazil Marketo user group and his sessions never disappoint. Uh, be sure to check out all of these wonderful offerings globally. Um, always something you can learn from hanging out with other Marketo engaged peers. Now, who am I? Who's this lady talking to you? Laura McCormick, I am your moderator. I am the VP of Consulting over at Revenue Pulse, a three-time champ, and I've been using Marketo since like 2012. So uh, been a long time coming for me. Our wonderful and illustrious panel includes Chris Willis, Chris Kelly, Corey Bayless, and Jimmy Spencer. But I think I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So with that, I will stop sharing and pass the mic on over to Chris Kelly for an intro. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, I am Chris Kelly. I am in the consultant side of business. I've been in consultancy for over 10 years now, uh, specifically in Marketo for going on about five years. Uh, I've gone through the entire gamut of small industry to large industry and because of the loveliness which is uh, consultancy I've I've seen a lot of different industries so uh, really interesting stories to be had here a lot of different learnings to share if you guys are interested please let me know find me on social media I'm happy to talk about um, all sorts of different things there so pass it off to Chris Willis we got a collection of Chris's here today. Um, so Chris Willis, I too have been using Marketo since 2012. Um, I am the founder, principal consultant at GTM Wranglers. I do um, uh, freelance um, marketing ops, revenue ops, and as you can imagine, have seen a lot of a lot of interesting things in in our space and look forward to sharing some stories and some um, lessons learned and thought leadership around those. And Corey, I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, hey everyone. My name is Corey Bayless, a uh, 10 year veteran on Marketo. Big, big instances in my portfolio, Microsoft and AWS. I uh, spent the last five years at AWS. I'm currently with um, TA Digital as a senior manager and running on the agency consulting side, getting uh, my feet wet there. Um, having a great time, uh, four year champion, uh, four time MCE. Um, and I definitely like to focus a little bit more on the technical side of things, as most might know. Um, so I'm definitely considered to be a full stack developer. I'm a nine year professional Python expert, uh, SQL uh enthusiasts and all the various other things and then i also really enjoy cloud architecting um it's been monumentally life-changing for my career and uh if you're interested in marketo and outside integrations and thinking outside the box i'd highly recommend looking into what cloud can do for you but yep, happy to be here super excited i'll pass it over to jimmy all right guys jimmy spencer uh, also a 10 plus year marketo veteran uh, I'm currently a principal engineer over at Verizon. Um, I span a variety of industries, uh, nonprofits, uh, telcos, uh, manufacturing, et cetera, right? Financial industries. So I've seen quite a bit. I've seen a lot of instances um, as my peers have here and uh, super excited to be here with you guys. Uh, I'm a two-time champion, uh, X time, probably four or five time MCE. And uh, like some of my peers here, I also enjoy the technical side of things. So uh, if you're looking to chop it up over APIs, technical implementations, integrations, or anything of the sort, uh, give me a holler. I'm out on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there. 
uh, always happy to connect with folks and uh, you know discuss what you guys might have going on. Beautiful. Well, I think we've got a decent amount of experience between the all of us. So hopefully we can answer some of the lovely questions that have come through uh, as people registered for today's events. Um, I think the one I want to start with is the newest product updates that everybody's the most excited for. Um, Jimmy, you want to kick us off there? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, when I saw that question come in and, um, you know, I, it, it took me a second because Marketo's made quite a few changes, or I, maybe I should say Adobe has made several changes, uh, you know, uh, as a, you know, an old timer in the game, it's it's always uh, Marketo for me. But um, I think for me, the the biggest game changer in terms of sort of your you know entry to mid level sort of admin type is the compute formula uh, capability that that they rolled out recently. I think it has a lot of potential to sort of help folks take that next step in terms of unlocking the power of their automations. Um, one thing that really comes to mind for me is something that I think a lot of folks struggle with, especially if maybe you're in a smaller to mid-sized organization and your development resources are a little bit tight. Um, as many of you probably know, Marketo sort of doesn't give you a great way to do comparisons, right? Comparisons between um, data sets on records, whether that's a string value or maybe a score value, which is also a hot topic that people are interested in. There, there's not really a great way to do that on site, right? With the compute flow step, uh, you're still not technically doing it on site, but with a much lower lift, you can sort of execute uh, you know, those types of activities and get the same result as you would someone who has much more resources at their disposal and can, for instance, ship that data off to a warehouse or some other inventory system that can do the calculations and comparisons for them. So uh, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, I think probably most or all of my peers are equally as excited about it uh, because it is such a huge, huge feature unlock for sort of your everyday user. And uh, it can bubble up, of course, um, sky's the limit in terms of how you can use that. So, Jimmy, I think um, I th one of the more interesting things that was an insight that came out of uh, doing a, a webinar for Adobe that was kind of uh, public facing was that there were so many people that were brand new users to Marketo that come into these sessions. If um, and Chris, I will shoot the mic right on over to you. Um, uh, maybe you can even help to answer this, but. What's the TLDR on that feature for somebody that's brand new? Like, how can they immediately grasp it and take advantage of it if they're still trying to get their arms around system utilization? Like, because I know with, with the group we have here, I think the value prop is kind of clear, but for somebody kind of newer, how can they make it less intimidating and make it actionable, do you think? Chris, I don't know, would you like to, to dive into that or add your thoughts here? Oh, Chris, you're muted. Great. You just um, che checking to see if I'm paying attention? I'm definitely paying absolutely. attention. Absolutely. All right, well. So I'll give a little bit of POV. I think Jimmy may have a more sophisticated answer. Um, I love that, that new feature around compute formula. And I, you just think about it in terms of like, I want to run like an Excel formula within Marketo. Like I want it, I want it do something outside of just the, like, I want to add points to something, which is essentially the only way you can do math and Marketo is through scoring today. The compute formula actually gives you a lot more capability. Um, it does require development experience um, because you, you've got to code those formulas into the flow step. But once those are in, it really unlocks a lot of potential for you to do kind of math related functions within your Marketo data. Um, answering the kind of the question that you had before, I think the, the features that I'm the most excited about are those that essentially integrate or like integrate a lot of our common MarTech tools 
that we've had to buy like we've had to buy like complex potentially expensive integrations into our Mar into our marketo instances and give us abilities within marketo natively that we used to have to like create integrations for um, totally. and and they were fairly complex so you think about interactive webinars where I can actually run the webinar program in a fairly sophisticated way within Marketo and get demand signals. Um, so if you're interested in that, I did a session last year at Summit uh, with the product team that really walks through the business case. Um, and there's been a lot of folks that have gotten some really good results out of um, interactive webinars. In addition, what, what they've done with that dynamic chat, um, with having chat like chat triggers and filters within Marketo and now the ability to do calendar scheduling, which you had would have to have gone and bought like another tool to do, all of that is now natively available and and it works within the same kind of the same metaphors. Um, so now you don't necessarily have to buy four tools to do your webinars, to do your chat, um, to do your calendar scheduling you can actually just consolidate that into one tool within Marketo and take advantage of some native features within the platform, which has been really exciting. Good call out, Chris. Yeah, I think um, Adobe's really gone to the table for development for feature functionality that not only would you have had to purchase these platforms, you'd have to integrate them and you'd have to bake them into your alignment with sales to pass that Intel over and kludge everything together. Well, it wasn't super impossible to do that before. It's so much more convenient. And how cool is it that we have the opportunity to lean into um, launching this feature functionality as like beta testers almost, like taking it out to market, innovating and, and finding the the first to market advantage for our companies. Chris, what's up? So yeah, building on top of, yeah, I got the mute button this time. The formal, the formal hand raise here in Teams, I'm just like, wow, I feel like I'm like professorial here with, with you guys. Right? You don't have to be so formal. You could just come off mute. One of the things I love about the fact that the webinars have come in is that there's the entry is is so much lower like the 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 level of entry is so much lower there are so many gotchas and industry experience that you need to have when you're bringing in so many different third party uh content like how how do you even bring it together like i have a program here in marketo and i have a program in my other third party instance how do i even do that to get started some of my content's coming over immediately some of it isn't how am I supposed to do that? Just wait three minutes? You know, like how would you how would you just know that you need to do all of these additional little massaging steps just to make something work? And yeah. and that's one of those things, kind of bringing that into Jimmy's original question about getting those um, additional um, space on the word right now, uh, those those com those uh, computations just allowing you to really personalize and and do exactly what you want to do within Marketo. Any number of tools that are brought in that allow you to do that, I'm all for it. There are so many times when I've been asked, hey, can I do X, Y, and Z, just adding these two fields together, can I do that? Or can I just have a tally counter of how many times somebody does something? And, you know, there's just so many use cases where just having the ability and flexibility um, with the new tools that Marketo is coming out with has just been a breath of fresh air. 100%. When I'm in other platforms and I see that they don't even have like LinkedIn lead gen forms available, and then I think about the fact that we have like appointment setting and chat and all of this um, kind of open-ended possibility in front of us to skip the implementation headaches and just use what's being offered up. It's powerful. Um, cool. And I, I see a question here kind of tying into integrations. Corey, maybe you'd like to speak to uh, AEM integration and how there's some best practices maybe that I think I'd like to tap into you and your experience around because um, someone in the audience would like to know more about AEM and how it integrates with Marketo. 
Yeah, Adobe Experience Cloud into Marketo is definitely its own uh, its own animal. Um, so right now, AEM uh, integration is a little bit limited in the fact that um, from AEM into Marketo, you're really creating your image uh, image repository. Instead of using images and files, you can use AEM to store it. But it also, one of the powerful things of AEM is renditions. So when you upload and you're doing creative content for email development, um, you have specific specs that you need your images to all meet in order to basically display correctly in an email. And a rendition allows for you to upload a high quality image in a, you know, a high pixel rate. And it allows for you to format that image into a 640 by 280 or 640 40 by whatever height of your you know banner images and that's actually critical for display in email um, so that's one of the huge advantages of AEM upload process as opposed to having to curate that image design in uh, Marketo to be five different you know images that you'd have to upload all in specific you know uh, you know pixelization uh, width and heights um, AEM allows for you to automate that process which is super super powerful and I cannot overestimate how important that is to really focus on that especially for your newcomers um, email is uh, emails its own animal, um, especially when you're doing design email. Um, you might think, oh, well, I'm just sending an email to people and I, you know, I don't need to do a whole lot and it's just text, right? Well, guess what? Like when you actually need to get into design email, it becomes its own thing, right? You got to curate your code to match all the specific email clients that are out there. And that involves a whole bunch of different technique that uh, we just don't even have time to go into. But essentially you're writing media queries into, for instance, I need my email to curate to, you know, everyone's favorite outlook, right? So you have to write special code that's called an MSO query that allows for you to curate those specific design elements to meet the different specifications that Outlook would require versus your Gmail. I didn't design the system. Don't hate me. Don't shoot the messenger, right? Um, but you really definitely need to understand that quality, especially if you want to provide the utmost best cu customer experience, which trust me, right? We all get email. We all see it. If the email is broken, email doesn't look good um, or it has some type of flaw to it, it immediately impacts my thinking of, what is this brand? You know, do I really want to trust these people if they can't actually get an email right? Does that mean they can get other things right? Or what other mistakes do they happen? Or one mm -hmm. of my common favorites is to see a CSS blob just blasted into my email design, my email um, outlook, right? Because there's a broken CSS uh, code in that particular email that the, they don't even know is happening in the first place. Or you know, Jimmy and I have this one as our favorite is where you get the um, hello person or hello first name, right? Because they don't actually have your name in the database. All these yes, things you really yes. need to, you know, check for, right? <laughs> so this is all kind of like involved in the email build process, but AEM definitely super, super powerful. And I just wanted to take a quick second also to call out a new feature that I really, really enjoy with Marketo. In fact, I used this for a client the other day. Instead of having to build a custom Python script in order to update 299 different pages um, within Design Studio, this one has actually been around for a little bit, but they've expanded that functionality. So now I can actually update uh, landing pages at 30 per which is yeah. really, really nice. You've always been able to do that, but guess what? They just moved that over into forms. So now if you have a whole nice. bunch of forms that you need to update, you can also do that in a design studio, which is huge. Otherwise you have to go one by one. And if you yeah. all know market automation is all about the least amount of clicks for the most amount of time. If I'm spending time doing clicks, I'm losing money for my company. So these are all different things that are definitely very um, improved features uh, in Marketo. Love the words of wisdom as ever, my friend. and. Why is Outlook always the problem child? You know, it just tried and true. You, you can always count on it to disappoint you, right? But yeah, good insights there. And, and thanks for the update on the forms. That's fabulous. Um, speaking of problem children in the room, uh, Mr. Kelly, I'd like to tap you to chat with us a bit on the notion of bot engagement and how that is making things muddy for us in our metrics. Um, I'm you glad you clarified because that could have yeah. sounded like I'm a problem child. No, no, sir. Uh, indeed, it is the bots that I take issue with, not you, my friend. Yeah, so um, handling block clicks uh, is a pretty difficult situation, no matter which way you slice it. So in terms of how you handle it directly within the email 
or if you're working with it within the reCAPTCHA and anything like that, there are many different ways that you can go about handling the bot instability. Um, so it really depends on the use case that you're running into. So if you're having a lot of attacks happening towards you um, on terms of like um, just blasting your uh, form fills and things like that, there is only so much that reCAPTCHA can do in that regard uh, in order to keep data from coming in. For example, I've seen cases where the same form has been entered 30, 40 different at a, at, a, at a time, right? So even Marketo couldn't keep up with the API calls to understand that this person that was spamming the input was actually the same person and it was creating duplicates. Right, so there's there's only there's there's only so much that certain content like that can happen. So uh, along the lines with your emails, always having like a honeypot or switching on the bot detection within your Marketo instance. Really, what it happens is it's a layered defense. Is what I would suggest. Have them all happening and have an understanding together within your corporation, uh, especially within sales and other people that you're reporting to that there's a give and take. So if you decide to say, let all the bots in, we know about it, we know the clicks, and all the other parameters that you're checking all make sense because you are bringing in all the clicks, you're bringing in all the people, all the form fills, all the numbers will all make sense because you have that information. You just need to have a way to solid, uh, to mark this person as a bot click, right? So tapping into the reCAPTCHA, saying reCAPTCHA has a high probability thinking that this person is a bot, go ahead and add that bot tag. If they're clicking on this honeypot link, go ahead and add them as a bot click. So that's one way of saying it. Bring in all the data. I want all of it. It all makes sense. All my reporting makes sense. And then the other way is to say, if it's a bot, I don't want to know about it. I want to block it. I want to I want to delete them. I don't want them in my system, anything like that. So that will mess up some of your other numbers that you're following. But there's there's many different ways that you can go about it. Um, if you want, there's also the custom route of putting in additional JavaScript on your front ends. And it's just a really in-depth topic that you can go down a rabbit hole pretty quick. So. It really depends, like I said, on that use case that you're really trying to solve, and that will allow you to really focus in that direction of right now, emails is my most important thing. So spend a lot of time figuring out your email and, and communicating that plan throughout your company and understanding that way. That's Corey, great, if you want to jump in on for, that. For anybody that's newer, I think, too, just to call out what the honeypot is, if on your field you have a hidden form field or a hidden link, Obviously, if it's hidden and no actual human can see it, but uh, a bot fills it out or clicks it, then that's it's not a Winnie the Pooh reference. That's the honeypot, right? And then you can um, handle the people accordingly. Well, the, the non-people people, the, mm -hmm. the, the bots accordingly, uh, based on their engagement with the hidden field. Um, but Corey, what were you going <laughs> to? Hi, Rico. Uh, Corey, what were you going to what were you going to add there? <laughs> Thank you, Rico. Poo happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, perfect. I just one one other thing, and just I think about Honeypot is if um, that form gets submitted and there's a value within the Honeypot, then you know that that's a bot um, because that form wouldn't be uh, human visible, right? So that's, that's kind of a good way to think about that logic. Another one they also want to think about is um, also a Honeypot on your emails because there are bot clicks that happen on yeah. your emails as well, follows the same process. But yeah, well said, Chris. So, Corey, on the email topic too, um, a lot of uh, companies you'll find in fintech or healthcare or places with high uh, cybersecurity um, or AI sometimes, depending on the company, um, when you're emailing, you'll see every link in your email is clicked because they have security software that's pre-clicking all the links that you have right. to test to see um, you know, for, for security reasons if it's a, if it's a threat or not. Um, that's not necessarily a question that's been submitted here, but I know it's a completely hot topic right now, especially when people for compliance reasons are looking at one click unsubscribe. We're having customers who are getting important uh, information sent to them 
the unsubscribed and operational emails are having to be used in order to connect with these folks um, due to their security settings. Uh, does the group want to kind of talk about that topic a little? I know it's it's been a hot one. So the, a good way to look at that is generally um, if every link, this is a little bit cumbersome of a setup, but it's a good way to do it if you're really looking for it is you can be looking for uh, a disqualification if every single link in your email is clicked. So that means if you're in a trigger campaign that you're setting up, you can add every link in there as to say, if they click on all of these links, then you also can determine that likely um, this is bot activity, uh, but it is, look, the world is not making email marketing easier by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> right? Agree. So you have to be you have to be really, really careful. Um, and you have to you you have to know your audience that you're sending to, right? Um, for large email sends, you're likely to see uh, a bloated metrics, right? As we know mm -hmm. that open rates in general are not a very dependable because obviously with iOS, right? iOS is an auto open. Um, yep. And so just you it, you have to understand sort of the tricks of the trade. And honestly, the best way to get that exposure is you have to experience it. <laughs> and that's not a very good way of saying it. But like that's true. That's like kind of true for this industry is that you really like use case is the determination of how you learn and how you progress. And all of that research and all the things that um, a lot of people go through, the community is a great resource to be able to kind of understand a lot of those key uh, key use cases and can really help you sort of curate your design. I'm not gonna pretend like I have all the answers because I certainly do not, but I can definitely tell you that when I do have those questions, I immediately go into Marketo community and product documentation to really look to see and do research on what has been found, right? right. What are the things that are happening? So that way I'm always bolstering my ability to understand things from a holistic perspective. And then when it comes to the execution, I also have a really good idea of the different tactics I can use to support you know, solving that various issue. But that's just yeah. my perspective. You learn from your peers, the good, the bad, the ugly, and you don't have to duplicate mm -hmm. their mistakes and you can double down on their their wins, right? I love it. I love it. Anybody else want to tackle the, the, the click conundrum? Yeah, well, I mean, I would just sort of echo, I think, where we're all going here. And, and the answer is there is no perfect solution, right? There, right. there is no genie anywhere that can 100% solve this issue for any of us. And, and and part of that is the fact that, you know, think about how quickly marketing automation has has mushroomed in the last few years and just the MarTech space in general. All the different services and products that have been added in the last five years, it's it's astronomical, right? It's it's enormous. Well, that's not just us, right? That's that, that's the entire tech space, especially cybersecurity, right? Cybersecurity is such a hot button issue. I mean, you have companies with data breaches and DDoS attacks and all sorts of things, right? So necessarily they are moving at an even more accelerated clip. So we will never catch them in such a way that we can have a perfect harmony with email. Now I saw a comment in the uh, comments uh, section there that said, well, how do you explain this to folks? And yeah. I, I think that the important thing is to sort of take off your technical hat for just a moment and just talk to them like we're talking now. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to understand the landscape, of course, right? Because you're gonna have to give them information, but you need to level set with them in plain English that there is no perfect answer to this, right? We can do the best that we can do with what we have, right? If you have an entire army of mops folks, maybe, maybe you can get things to like a 90% rate where you're catching things, but odds are you don't have that at your disposal. I don't know of any organization that's sufficiently staffed, no matter who it is, to tackle things on that level. So really yeah. there has to be a, an expectation that's set with these are the tools that we have, this is what we know <laughs> about our audience to Corey's point, and these are the steps that we can take to mitigate it as much as possible. And when you have those conversations with folks and you sort of level set and put things in plain English with them, um, it's it's a little bit easier for them to digest and accept. So I, I think, you know, sort of putting that softer edge on things is really the right way to go 
when you're having those talks and and facing those hard questions with a group that maybe isn't technically inclined or maybe you know has a pretty severe pain point. Yeah, I think the onus of communication lies with the speaker, not the listener, and making sure that whomever you're communicating this information to, that you're not, I think it's just Cal, in fact, I know it's just Cal, that has the notion of geek speak for the C-suite, right? So you need to be able to translate how you think and, and, and interpret the situation into language that matters for your audience. So like, say Rebecca, if you're um, trying to communicate with sales stakeholders, why all of a sudden Honeywell looks like a super qualified target account that's thoroughly engaged with the score off the roof, and you realize it's because some kind of security software had a click on every link for every employee at Honeywell that you just emailed. Um, it's important, I think, to step back and think about how you're socializing activity with sales, have some fail safes for yourself mm -hmm. and set up, um, you know, ways to hold that information back before you're certain it's bulletproof. Um, Chris, would you like to add something there? I would, because Jimmy, you, you stepped off on to something that was really important. And I think we in the demand gen and the marketing ops industry need to have a level set and real talk about the value of opens and clicks in that's right in our prospecting because we've we've largely treated these as scorable activities and we're seeing more and more often like with the bot clicks um as well as like what is the value of a click anyways do do you know, we've seen these memes where, you know, somebody clicks on an email and they become an MQL and, you know, you got that funny meme picture. But in reality, like, what does it tell us? Do we do we want to measure more meaningful version, uh, meaningful like engagement and really just leave email clicks to our email marketers to try to optimize that and get people to engage with our content? Um, rather than splitting hairs over opens and clicks. That's kind of my take on yeah. that whole bit. I would like to echo that. Some of the most uh, successful interactions I've had is when you try and break it down with just that scoring example. Do you really consider somebody who opened 50 emails, just open them, the same value as somebody who has signed up and attended three different webinars or an event or actually reached out and asked to speak to someone because over the course of time if you are scoring just an open or click it will reach the same level as those people who interacted with you on a much deeper and more meaningful level so really trying to put that into perspective of what you're actually scoring and how if you just leave these automated processes to just work for you in the background, what type of data you are going to be generating over the long term. So 100% want to echo what Chris Willis and Jimmy were talking about. Trying to have those really great communications between all of the different teams that interact with you because you need them to understand what data they will have and what resources you have to produce that data. So I know it's a lot of technical speak and things like that, but it's really trying to find that main pain point like Jimmy was talking about. What is the main issue here? And then try and find a solution for that. But as you're doing that, you're able to educate everyone around you. You're able to think ahead long term and really get that interaction that really makes the Marketo system so powerful. Getting that handshake with sales, getting the handshake with the C-suite above you. If they understand what you're going through, when they ask you to do something and you say no, you know, they, they understand it's it's no, like it, it can't happen. Or when you reply back, here's option A, here's option B, I and then having that continuous conversation. So just want to echo what the other guys were saying there. 
Yeah, Chris, yeah. I think relevance is important here. If you're handing information over to sales, it's not actionable. They're not going to have you in the same credible light. They're not going to follow up on your leads with um, as much enthusiasm if you're giving them noise, right? To your point about the opens, like, is that person actually going to answer the phone? Have they given you consent at that point to be handed off to sales? And I think consent-based marketing, we're pivoting from like digital um, intel and behavior monitoring to an era of consent, right? Like, I mean, when you think about the changes in compliance that we're seeing um, across the major platforms like Google, you know, and Gmail and, and the way that the game is changing here, if people come to our site and they don't give consent for our, our cookies to track them, you know, it's going to be a different landscape and that landscape is here. People keep talking about GA4 and consent based marketing like it's off in the distance. GA4 has been here since last July and consent based marketing is here as of this month. And I think there's a question that's pretty interesting here around this topic for you, Mr. Willis, um, around the Gmail spam limitation of 5K a day. Would love to pick your your brain on on this topic. Uh, this has been a topic that I've been noodling quite a bit. Um, yeah. And I don't know if there's necessarily an easy, like an easy answer if we're following the same practices that we've been following for like say the last 12 years that I've been in this, you know, MarTech world. Um, I think it does come down to consent-based marketing, you know, absolutely. But we need to think about consent-based marketing broader than just, okay, we got you to check a box that says, hey, I want you to email me. And then we kind of take that in carte blanche. You know, consent-based marketing, like ultimately we're, we're listening for feedback loops from the customer constantly as to, okay, are they still engaged or not? Is, you know, are, are we, are we emailing them too much? Um, have we have we exhausted, you know, exhausted kind of our outbound, you know, tolerance with this customer? And it it goes it goes far beyond the you know the technical things that we talk about, like one click, click unsubscribe, demark, like those are all the technical bits, and that's what we're all rushing to solve. But ultimately. It's a conversation that needs to be had about batch and blast marketing altogether, and you know having more conversations with our uh, with our audiences, looking at recent engagement, making sure that that engagement is relevant enough that we're confident that this person wants us to send them communications, and be willing to sh to shrink our lists in order to be relevant with our audience and being and you know we're going to have to probably stand up to some folks in our sales and marketing group who are asking us to email the whole database when we know that that's going to hurt us um, and develop better engagement focused email strategies rather than rather than just kind of the batch and blast approach i had a fortune 100 heck fortune 50 uh, company client that uh, midway through last year, decimated a 5 million person database and dragged it down to 150K, deleted all the history, and it was like hard to watch. But now they are positioned strategically to not think about database expansion as this relentless pursuit of top of funnel names and leads and, you know, um, bloat, let's face it, uh, venture capital fueled bloat at the top of the funnel, they're now um, thinking around, you know, the pivot that, that we've made as an industry kind of followed their suit, their logic around a highly curated, focused list of target accounts that are within their SAM, within their TAM, that are actually engaged and actually have provided consent. And they are doing better now than ever before with this approach. Did I did I fall out of my chair when I heard the edict that we were going to just like burn the database to the ground? Yeah. Has it pivoted them to be welcome guests in the inboxes that they're actually showing up in? 
hundred percent. Are they sending noise over to sales anymore? Not really. Are, it, the target account lists are never perfect, and it's always kind of like the dream date for prom. And you know, you have to be willing to reconfigure that and reevaluate that on a regular basis. But um, it's interesting to watch the pivot from the boundless exponential top of funnel growth down to a very focused um, list of priority contacts. But I'm seeing it happen in real time. It's pretty fascinating. So I wanted yeah, to add kind of to that, and kind of to that end, most of that conversation that's happening at the top of the funnel is now happening in the dark web. That's so right. We have to pivot our strategy away from like away from kind of mass email. Email has a place, but it has to be engaging. Like, and I applaud your client. That was that that took guts. To it do sure that. did. It was um, it was a a trailblazing female CMO that just came in, and everybody was flabbergasted. But it's making a lot of sense here now that the dust is settling. But what it means is that we have to pivot. And the top of funnel is more in the communities. It's within the rating and review site. It's on it's on the social platforms. It's engaging with people where they are and earning the right to get the consent to go deeper with them. It's reputation, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, it's important that I think um, that we focus on how email supports other channels and isn't, you know, a, a vacuum or a silo all its own, you know? Yeah, so I really wanted to add a couple of things too, is that one other thing that I'm with my clients that I'm seeing is email programs that stand alone do not work anymore. And I highly don't recommend using them. And when you're setting up your statuses um, as a success metric, you're really looking for the key integrations with uh, your webinar form fills. Like form fills are an indication of, I am raising my hand, talk to me. I'm interested in the things that you have to say. And that is part all, all part of the consent process that you really, right. really, really wanna be hyper-focused on, right? When you do get consent from a customer that they want you to talk to them, that is your main priority That's to right. not blow that person's inbox up. You must respect that process more than anything else, that transparency and that trust is basically the customer saying, I trust you to not bother me at every step of the way. If I'm interested in taking action, I will take action. We're all people, right? You ask yourself, if I'm setting up this program, how would I respond to this? That's if right. I think this is good content and I'm sending an email out to my customer, and it's something that I would want to click on or that I would want to take action on, or if it was an office hours call, or if it was Jimmy's webinar that he did last week, or it was Katya's webinar, and I saw that information, I was like, man, that actually is meaningful for me. Guess what? Now we're getting into the elements of personalization. Static email. Just at all costs, do everything you can to curate the experience to your That's customer. Right. Create that trust, create that brand. Now, a couple of things. Number one, demand gen is a must for every company in the 21st century. You cannot cold call anyone anymore. I won't even pick up my Thank phone if you. I don't even know what the yes. customer or who is calling me, right? And if I do, it's on accident. <laughs> right, right. So here's the big, here's the big thing. We're in a situation where what we are doing is absolutely necessary for any company in order to succeed in this marketplace. But we're also seeing that we're overutilizing this responsibility, right? So we have to be much more sophisticated in how we talk to our customers. And that means thinking sophistication in how we build out our programs, how we build out our Marketo instances, how we build out our scoring. It's not just, did they click an email? It's, did they click an email? And what was the follow-up, right? Yeah. There are two ways that you cookie somebody. And how we gather data, yeah. Right? Two ways we cookie somebody. They either click an email and go to a landing page and they're cookied with Munchkin, right? Or the second is they fill out a form. You tell me with the new rules, <clears throat> the new rules in place, how I'm supposed to continue that engagement in a successful way that allows for me to capture the right analytics that lead to intent. 
that lead to a person that actually should be moving through my RCM model. That's just right. some just some rules for thought. I think so. it's about it's about hand raising around value and uh, expressing consent, but it's also about um, I love the point that you touch on there, Corey, about flipping the script and pretending you're on the receiving end of the inbox or the programs. It's like I saw this um, CRO thought leader that I love to follow on LinkedIn. They were like, would you pay money for what you're putting out into the ether right now to promote your company? Would you literally pay money? Then why would you pay time if time is more valuable than money for your prospects? Why are you expecting them to give you their time in exchange for something that won't advance their career, that won't make their life easier, won't make them sleep better at night, won't inspire them to do more, won't protect their team or their budget. Like if you're not delivering that kind of value in this day and age, you won't get the consent and you'll be um, an annoyance. And we have to be cognizant of that, I think. And we have to be willing to tell our internal stakeholders that that's facts. We're we're the guardians of the database. We're the guardians of the experience for the people that we're engaging with. And we're the good stewards of sanity around expectations. And their data. That's yeah. right. So, well, and, and, and that data. is facts. That is facts. But yeah. you also, you need to come with your facts. You need to come with a full picture. Because right. honestly, you have to start that fight well before you make that proposition. Well before you tell people that, hey, we need to get away from vanity metrics or we need to score in a more conscientious, thoughtful way. You, it's a you, you have to shift the culture, right? Which is a is a big deal, mm -hmm. a big, big deal. Uh, you know, you think about it, everybody wants big numbers, right? Everybody wants to send a ton of leads and they wanna have the most calls and you know, they wanna do this and that and the other, right? Like it's all about these metrics. Same thing with email, vanity metrics. Why do they matter? Well, because someone cares about them. And having those attitudes and those notions change is a really long fight. And I would say, if you want to go in that direction and have your organization mature, you have to start having conversations early and often about what really matters and what really counts. And that's gonna lead to some uncomfortable conversations mm -hmm. because people do not like it when you mess with their numbers because mm -hmm. numbers feel like a, a warm jacket on a cold night, right? They're safe, they make you feel good. And getting to the heart of what really matters means saying, hey, our sales team hates us right now because <laughs> we're sending them so much bloat, right? And it, it's over and over, it's, it's reaffirming, it's having those conversations and getting those attitudes to start to reshape before you make the big proposals in terms That's of right. this is mm -hmm. how things are, need to be. It's operational change management and it's it's radical candor and it's finding mm -hmm. an executive sponsor that knows you know your stuff, bending their ear, building internal advocacy, taking the sales rep that's the hardest to please and the one that's the flag wave, waving fan of marketing, getting them both to be bought in to your changes that you recommend. Everybody else in your sales work is going to fall in line if the mm -hmm. two bookends of extreme perception around marketing's value are in line with you and your executive sponsor. You can really affect some major change when Absolutely. you're an ops. I think that's why I love it so much. To some degree, Google has forced this conversation, and that's right. we have the We do have an opportunity. It's somewhat of a once in a lifetime opportunity to influence this conversation right now. And sales is paying attention too, because all of their out, outreach, sales loft, they get impacted by this as well. So it's not just marketing, we're all in this boat together and we're either, gonna, right. we're either gonna rise or sink together. So it is our opportunity to influence the conversation because we've been living this for the last you know, 10 plus years. Yeah, so things that I've seen recently is that it's just like Jimmy said, numbers are my big, warm, comfy blanket. These numbers have led us to success. You know, we've we've had year over year growth because of these numbers, but those numbers were also based off of the technology and how certain yeah, clients, course. certain clients are used to being interacted with. But technology is changing at light speed, an unfortunate and fortunately, as that occurs, 
the way that clients expect to be interacted with is also changing at light speed. So in order to try and meet those expectations, I, I just spent five, 10 interactions with you trying to get something to happen. And you're not tracking each one of those touch points with me. And I'm having to reiterate again and again and again to try and get my point across or whatever. That's a great way to lose that client for future or lose perspective of other uh, companies that do the same thing. So it's one of those things where you really need to understand how things are changing around you, how certain clients or the people that you're marketing to are expecting to be marketed to. It's not a, it's not listen to your company telling you how to do it. No, you listen to the people that you want to be your customer. They are the ones who will tell you what they want. They are the ones who are going to give you your warm, fuzzy numbers. It's not going to be the same warm and fuzzy numbers, but it's going to change how you need to appropriate the communication. So 100% have those talks and have them early, but do your research, have your numbers ready, and yes. and and stand for what you believe because right. things are always going to be changing. And that's something that we as marketers, especially with the automation process need to be ready for constantly right. updating ourselves. And it's good for you too. Like, I mean, it might feel uncomfortable to call it the 900 pound, you know, situational gorilla in your organization, but being that change agent, if you do it in a data driven way is how you're going to get the career growth you're looking for uh, within your company, within your field. Um, it ain't easy. It ain't always pretty, but um, that's how you innovate and learn. You got to be able to look down the street and around the corner on behalf of your organization. And so much of that insight comes from your customers and prospects. You can do win-loss interviews alongside your sales team. That knowledge is invaluable. It's it's a direct intersection with what you're trying to do as an ops professional. But we only have a couple of uh, minutes left. I could talk to you guys all day. Um, <laughs> we'll save that for Summit, I suppose. But um, any final thoughts we want to share here? I, if your question didn't get asked, feel free to reach out to any or all of us on LinkedIn. Um, there were so many, it was too much for us to get to. Um, but yeah, any final thoughts, if you'd like to put a bow on it as as we wrap here? Um, maybe uh, Mr. Willis, we'll start with you. Absolutely. Um, I think this is one of the most candid conversations that I've been a part of in um, in office hours, and this is just amazing. Um, this group is awesome. Um, one of the questions that didn't get answered, but I'll I'll give a pithy answer, is around best and worst Marketo capabilities. And oh, I think I answered probably sure. answered the <laughs> best in a while. And I I hate to call them worst, but there are gotchas because Marketo is so easy to use. And, you know, think about your operational processes. Think about like, um, think about the gotchas that come with Marketo being so scalable and easy to use. Um, because sometimes what, sometimes the best features can end up being the worst features if you're using them poorly. So definitely, you know, if you're coming to Summit, come and see us at the at the Champ Smart Bar. Um, you know, join calls like these and learn how to scale your instance and leverage these technologies for for good um, rather than creating mess. Um, that would, I think, that's my all I have to say about that. To quote Forrest Gump. What I'd like to add is uh, this is an amazing community. We all want to talk as much as possible, as you have seen on this call, but it's not its not just the champions, right? The entire Marketing Nation community, any type of outreach, uh, the social medias, people always want to help. So if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask them. Always be vocal and you'll always find somebody out there to try and help as best they can.
we're in this together. And I think that's a great thought to leave um, the, the call on. Thank you so much to our esteemed panel. And thank you uh, to all our CHAMP network supporters that have made this event possible. Um, catch us again next time. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, you all. Thanks, everyone.